Thank you, Nana. Thank you all for coming. Uh, it is a pleasure to talk to you today. I thought that this uh, talk title was surprisingly short, just imagination and victory. Uh, so I'm going to fill that out a little bit by saying I want to talk today about the role of imagination in victorious Christian living, not just victory, I don't know, victory over what, but victorious Christian living is what we want to talk about. Now, imagination is one of the most noticeable features of humanity, yet it's extremely hard to explain or define. We don't, we don't uh, put our finger on this. In fact, it's, it's something that nobody agrees about. Nobody agrees what is imagination. Uh, but we all, know, we all know what it is, but we can't... Uh, it's probably like poetry. There's no good definition of poetry, but we all know... Uh, what it is. So we tend to think very little about our imagination itself, but we think with it all the time, right? We don't think about the concept of imagination, but it's very basic, uh, very central to any basic human functioning. The difference between mankind and animals in this area uh, is very significant, right? It's so vast that it's hard to even talk about, even though I remember all the way from my childhood, some little cartoon that Man is just the human animal, like we're the human animal, we're another animal, we're another mammal. And I remember that being a thing from my childhood of my parents saying, false, this, this cartoon is lying to you. <laughs> you are not just another animal. Uh, we have at our house two very smart dogs. They're for dogs, they're smart. Uh, and yet never once have I come home to find them having done something constructive. <laughs> They don't do it. They don't do it. The only constructive things a dog might do are things that are destructive in a way that helps a human be constructive. When they kill a mouse, I'm happy with them. They've done their job. But they're not at all constructive, and they never will be constructive. Every toddler or very small child might stack blocks, try to write something, try to draw a picture. Uh, they try to communicate immediately with their words. Uh, Every toddler is way ahead of any animal when they laugh at their own wit or they try to play peekaboo with you to surprise you or something. They have an imagination. But dogs, they really are one of the animals with the most inner life. You know, they are funny. They have stuff going on. Uh, never build a fort or paint a picture. For all their cleverness, they only destroy because they have no imagination. And when they are beautiful which they are sometimes, and this, this is a good time to tell you one of my life mottos, only get a beautiful dog, because then when they're being bad, there's still some redeeming quality there. <laughs> you you want to have a reason to have that dog, even when it's being very bad. Uh, but when they're beautiful, it's never their own artistry that is making that beautiful. It's God's. They're, they're being beautiful as a creature. Uh, you know, when they're in the field looking beautiful, chasing a bird or something, uh, they, they are not beautiful because they are making beauty. They're beautiful because they were made to be beautiful. And they're simply, it's very simple, they're not made in the image of God, right? This is the difference between uh, mankind and the animals. And what sets humanity apart is not only that we can reason, which I think many Christians often think this is just our, this is our minds, our reasoning, our logical ability, uh, but it's actually what sets us apart from the animals is that we have access to some kind of an inner life of the mind, which we could call imagination. In every art form, and I would, I would describe art here as very broadly defined, like it would encompass what Becca was talking about, this art form that we all communicate this way, we all understand it. Uh, in every art form, imagination plays a significant part. Uh, can any bridge or building be built without the imagination of mankind. It, it cannot. Can a body be clothed without imagination or a story be told? Even a true story, even a true like this just happened and I'm trying to relay it to you, cannot be told without imagination. Can words mean anything if you were talking to someone with no imagination? If you think, is it how weird is it that I can make a sound and you know what I'm talking about? I can say, we have a bad dog. And everyone's like, mm. you know, like we've immediately communicated much bigger concepts than is really possible uh, in those short words. Can a poem, if you think about that, a series of squiggles on a piece of paper 
that when we read it, it can call forward a series of images that somehow communicate to the reader of those squiggles something much more complex like isolation or sorrow or distance, tension, shame, or love, uh, unless that reader had access to some internal world where this language is spoken and understood. We understand in some way that is inside of us. So imagination in mankind is tied up in the fact that we are made in the image of God and we have souls, right? This is communication on a deeper level of our creaturehood. We live in a world, though, obviously, bad news, with a sin problem. We are imaginative beings with a sin problem. And this makes our imaginations vulnerable, right? This means our imaginations are not pure. They're not, they're not undefiled. They're not, uh, they're not always right. So we have this, uh, think of how many times have you heard the phrase that's a cliche that is, that really captured my imagination, right? I heard something, it captured my imagination, it, it caught on inside of me in a way that I, could, that I really couldn't stop thinking about. And it would be very foolish for all of us uh, to think even for a moment that capturing our imaginations is not one of the main goals of our God-hating culture right, to take, to take hold in your imagination, uh, to be, and many Christians have gone astray because our imaginations have been captured by a worldly narrative of something, like just think how many Christian imaginations have been captured by someone else's story of what it means to be loving or kind, right, that's an imaginative failure we're having, we've been told a story, we've bought into it, we think, well, to be loving means always to say, I approve of whatever you're doing, right, to, it's a story of this is what it means to be a loving or a kind person, and then we've let that shape our understanding of how to live. Our imaginations are fed and shaped and encouraged through all art, not, I don't mean just art proper, all human communication and art, uh, think of how many expressions of imagination are all around us all the time. Uh, what Becca was talking about, clicking on the link through. Tons of the things that we do intentionally uh, are meant to be communicating much vaster uh, things. So think about the fact like we get glimpses all the time into what people believe and what they believe enough to want to communicate, right? What they actually have a deeply held belief and what they want to communicate. So fashion, even the clothes that are just worn by our fellow Walmart shoppers, music, even the background noise we think we're ignoring, uh, the really overt art forms like movies, TV shows, uh, and then architecture, painting, city planning, food presentation, makeup tutorials, everything around us all the time is the fruit of human imagination and communication. We use our imagination, creativity, and art to talk about things we can't talk about through other means. We can't easily communicate in other ways. But we are, all of us, always communicating with one another on deeper levels, always listening and always speaking. We're always doing that. This is part of being human. Now, clearly, I am using the term imagination in a broad way, and I'm doing that on purpose. Uh, this is another way of saying really the image of God, the soul, the inner life, right? Imagination is something bigger inside of you, not just a how good are you at making up a random fairy tale on the fly to tell a kid. It's your, what's your imagination? What's your understanding of the whole world? Every human communicates from that place within yourself to others. Now, the world wants to take your imagination captive. It wants to take your imagination captive with falsehoods. And when we actually think about how far each of us are from the biblical admonition to take every thought captive to Christ, we can see how much success they have had with us, right? Is our every thought actually captive to Christ? Or does that sound like an absurd standard that no one could ever uh, achieve? That's from 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verses three and following. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Think how, that is such a tall order 
bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, many of us have imaginations that are held captive in different corners of our lives by carnal influence. Is your imagination of love and marriage, especially for you young girls, something that has been communicated to you through a thousand chick flicks, through a thousand renderings of the world's ideas of love and romance? Has it been fed by fantasy, by advertisements and envy? Or is your idea of children and having children something that has been uh, captured by whatever images caught your fancy? And does it struggle once you get there to really having children under the weight of the reality of the duties involved? This is something that you had an imaginary world and then it is weighed down by the reality. Or your idea of a Christian home, something that was gifted to you by Instagram influencers, right? Or the somebody who's making pictures and trying to build up your imagination of what your home ought to be like. Uh, is it something we've made up by sidelong glances and personal desire? So the world has their myths Myths and stories and narratives, like if you think the chick flick myth, the, those narratives that we've all had embedded that are in our imaginations, we see the world this way. Uh, but the world has those all the time. They're always pawning them off on us. Uh, things like a narrative that real fulfillment and success is found in your career, right? That that's going to be where you get it. Well, we've all taken that in a lot of ways. But in all those cases, the Christian faith is generally actually in direct opposition, perfect opposition to the world's narratives. If we were shaped by the word of God, if we were taking every thought captive to Christ, our vision for such things that are of paramount importance would be much different than they are, right? Our imagination would have been shaped by something else. Now, why? What, what is the central narrative or the central myth, but myth with a capital M as in a true story that shapes you know, a myth would be the story that shapes a people's understanding of who they are, what they're there for. So I'm not saying a myth is in false. I'm saying the central Christian myth with a capital M, the central narrative of our faith, is the resurrection of Christ, right? That is the thing that is the heart of all Christian imagining, all Christian imagination, all art, expression, communication. At the very heart of it is the fact that Jesus Christ died and yet he lives, it's the heart of everything. And thus we see that imagination, this, this concept of our imagination, when it's baptized like this, could as easily answer to another name, faith, right? You could say, we believe this. Faith, as it says in Hebrews, is the substance of things hoped for, the certainty of things not seen. What is that if not this imagination of this understanding that you have inside you of what's real in the world, how the world works, how things happen. When mom told that story about uh, dad as a kid praying for the milk, that's a, story that, that's a story that probably caught many of our imaginations, but she said, how did that shape his faith, right? Can you imagine how that shaped his faith to pray something, see God answer it, and have it shape your understanding of something way bigger than how you get milk, right? It was shaped an understanding of who God is, how he cares, how the world works, how the real world really works. Uh, so we, a bunch of Christians, have not seen the resurrection, but because we believe it and because we're certain of it, it shapes everything. It shapes our perspective of literally everything that comes to us, uh, whatever we're receiving and understanding from other people, and it shapes everything coming out of us, whatever we seek to communicate and express. Now, this means that the Christian imagination will always be fundamentally countercultural. Uh, we are actually, I kept wanting to say this during Becca's talk, because she kept, she kept quoting Oscar Wilde. And I think around the same time, G.K. Chesterton was very involved in a lot of the battles about the arts. And he made the argument that the reason that the only arts that were any good were because someone believed so seriously in something. Uh, and he was citing, like, this play is good because somebody cares so much about communism that they made a good play about it. He would have said Oscar Wilde is... Oscar Wilde is so good at expressing this meaninglessness only because he really believes, only because he's actually, it's, he's actually tapping into his faith 
to express this. And the only reason that we're all understanding it and, and communicating well is that he was, in a way, telling the truth about what he believed about his faith. That was a sidetrack. I just kept thinking of that one when she was talking. Uh, but the resurrection should shape everything in our lives. Now, this means that we will always be countercultural. We'll be understanding everything that comes in counterculturally and everything that goes out is countercultural. We are different creatures, not only because we have been given new hearts and have our minds renewed by the word of God, we are different creatures because what we believe is fundamentally different. We believe that the world is fundamentally different. And our imaginations, if they are taken captive by Christ, have two very shocking features. These are wonderful strengths of the Christian faith. First, we believe that all real Christian fruitfulness starts in death. That's very countercultural. Every piece of fruitfulness starts in laying your life down because we believe that that is fundamentally the best way to live. But there's also more than that. Because we believe not only in the resurrection, but also in the incarnation, we believe that what is available to us to use to express these glorious, glorious realities is everything in the world, right? Everything we can lay our hands on is available for us to use to try to communicate these wonderful truths. So every expression of beauty or art or music or words or just speaking and dressing ourselves and setting our tables, every bit of our living should be shaped by those fundamental realities. The Son of God became an infant, was born into this world we live in today. He grew into a man, and if the timing had been right, you could have fed him a meal. You could have been there to give him a drink of water. You could have seen his miracles or touched the hem of his garments because he was that real. He was that actually present in the world. And there's, so there's nothing inappropriate in us expressing our faith in Christ in plates of food, in garments, in glasses of water. In fact, that one is specifically commanded, isn't it? Specifically, when, when giving out glasses of water, do it as though you're giving it to me. Whatever we do, we ought to do to the glory of God because the glory of God has come into this world. Because the glory of God is here, we can do whatever we're doing to the glory of God. So God has done something so kind for us in this. Not only have we been given a unique and marvelous truth to communicate to the world, we have also been given the whole world to use in that communication, the whole world to use to express these things. We've been told to be fruitful, and we have been taught that fruitfulness by our Savior who died. John 12, 23, But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So not only did the Lord give us this earth-shattering paradigm as the foundation of our faith, but he gave each one of us who understands it millions, and I do mean millions, of opportunities to die, with each one of them yielding a bountiful head of grain right? How many opportunities do you actually have to die to yourself in a day? I'm not sure any of us can count that high. <laughs> like, I'm not sure. I know, at least in my own life, that becoming a mother was sort of the time that my, my blinders came off and I noticed how many opportunities to die I was having. I'm sure I was having them before, but it was way more in your face once, once you have all these little people around you. So he gave us all of these opportunities for fruitfulness. We follow Christ by planting our lives, by seeing the whole world through this perspective, this confidence that dying to ourselves is actually living to Christ, right? This confidence uh, that living to Christ is no death at all, but rather a multiplication of life. This, this is a fundamental reality of our faith. It's, it's true in the world. And if you believe that, if you actually believe this to be true, you can't not be fruitful and living an abundant life because if you believe it to be true, you will be dying to yourself. You will be thinking this is the, this is the path to following Christ. 
So we've been called to fruitfulness and we have been put in a world that is supernaturally, impossibly fruitful when we live in it by faith, right? When we do it by faith, when we walk in the certainty of those things we cannot see, but we nonetheless know to be true, this is a full throttle, fruitful, abundant Christian life. And this is also why a good full throttle Christian imagination is extremely central to victorious Christian living. Oftentimes when I'm talking to young mothers or to, usually they're young mothers, they'll say something like, well, I didn't lose my temper at the kids today. Where's the fruit? I mean, like, like I did, I did one little thing you told me to do and I, and I, I'm like waiting, tapping my foot, looking for, looking for some payback. That is just a funny amount of unbelief, right? Like to think that I'm not actually accepting that this is a reality, or it's the way my dad would say, it's a, it's a kindergartner planting a bean and then digging it up five minutes later. You know, like, what happened in there? Is it doing it? Uh, uh, but we're called to die to ourselves over and over in scripture. We're called to die to ourselves, and we're called to lay our lives down. We're called to follow Christ uh, in this. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting, I, I love this topic because I think it brings up so many different angles on things that are very familiar in scripture, okay? So like, we've all heard these things before, but maybe not thought of them from this perspective. Because introducing a word like imagination into a talk about faith might be a little unsettling, right? It's a little bit like, well, are you sure? Are you sure this is an imaginative venture? Uh, but it is. What about James? When he talks about what if we have faith that produces no works, it produces no action, no lived out testimony that this is what we actually believe and long to express. Well, what he says is that faith without works is dead, right? If you believe something, but it's not actually driving action, then that faith is dead. And if that's the case, uh, we have probably put our beliefs or like our doctrinal beliefs in a file cabinet somewhere where it's affecting nothing in our life, right? We've put that, it's not in our imagination. That's not our imagination being captured by uh, Christ. That's our, that's like we have a dusty document somewhere that we could cite if desperately called to, but we're not actually living it because we don't believe it to be true. We don't, we didn't, we didn't take it on as this is the reality in the world. We've put it in a file cabinet somewhere. And I do want to say that the wonderful Reformation doctrine of by faith alone, it's a, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing, but the, our problem is that then we think faith is some little thing, like faith is some little, I can show my card, you know, like I have a, I have a document here, I have a, my faith as some little dry thing, instead of my faith being my entire reality the way I see the world. Like my faith is all of it, right? My faith is the whole thing. Somebody told me one time, uh, because she wanted to watch a bad movie a long time ago. She said, said, well, Rachel, you just have to to take off your Christian worldview to enjoy it. You know, you have to just lay that aside, Uh, which was funny. I mean, it was funny in a lot of ways. But the real thing is she was like, as though your Christian worldview could just be a pair of glasses, that your Christian worldview couldn't be your eyeballs themselves, right? If I take that off, I have nothing to see it with, right? If I I remove that, I'm not going to enjoy anything about it. Uh, The the idea that our faith is something we activate in times of crisis or like we'll implement this or pull it out of the file cabinet occasionally shows that we have not taken our thoughts captive to Christ. We have not let the reality of what he's done in this world actually be our reality of what's happening in the world. We have not accepted it in that way. But if you actually believed these things. If we actually believe in the incarnation and the resurrection, we couldn't help but live it out, right? There's nothing you can do to keep you from living it out, living it out. Jesus actually came to this earth, this one. He actually died on the cross with the weight of your sin and mine and the sin of the world on him. And then he actually came back from the dead three days later without our sins. And he's now at the right hand of the father interceding for us. And if we believe that, How could that not inform everything that we hear or we say or we do? It is a different world that Christ came back from the dead in. Now, make no mistake here, because I think that this is, every time I say something like faith without works is dead, works are not popular. Works of any kind, good works, 
obedience is a bad word in a lot of places, uh, or not, it's not a popular topic. But this is, this is another important thing. It's not whether, but which. Uh, the call that your faith must be producing good works in, to show its life, it's not a call to something that humans don't do all the time. We work we're any works and expressions of faith. That's what every human is doing all day long, all the time, right? We can't stop that. So if you say, don't tell me, don't tell me to do good works. You're just saying, because I'm going to keep on doing my bad ones, right? Like you want that, that space is still full of something. When we kick against our calling as Christians and don't want to lay our lives down and, fo- and we don't want to follow Christ, at that moment, we're still living out something. We're just living out unbelief. We're living out what it means to not actually believe God. It is barren and hopeless and lost and unfulfilling, but it's not free of works. It's not free of fruit. Jesus says in Matthew 7, you will know them by their fruits, right? We know people by their fruits because everyone is producing fruits all the time. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. This is what I mean by a Christian imagination. I think every human who's made in the image of God has an imagination, has faith, has in their soul something that is informing everything that they are doing. The question is, is it good or bad fruit? Is this an imagination that is full of faith in God and love for Christ? Or is this an imagination that's full of unbelief and love for self, right? Is it, which way is it? What are you expressing? Because either way, all of us are made in the image of God. We are imitative. We're made in the image of God. We're made to imitate him. So we are all of us small c creators, small m makers, small s speakers. Either way, we are producing the fruit all the time of our closely held beliefs. The fruit, that part, is a given and it cannot be restrained. But it's either the fruit of life that declares God or it's the fruit of unbelief with the stench of death. Those are our options. So while it continues to be what dad says all the time, that your theology comes out your fingertips, it is also true that whatever is coming out your fingertips is your actual theology, right? Whatever's coming out is what's actually in there. Uh, What was it that you wanted to communicate to your children about God when you were angry and yelling at them? What was it? Now, People will say, oh, I was just making a mistake. But if we really mercilessly peel back the layers, what we might find at such a moment is that you wanted them to see that you are God and they have offended you, right? It's not your actual theology there is a theology of the self. Because there's no room to say, oh, I am yelling at you because God is faithful and just to forgive us all in righteousness. That's what that was about. Or I'm yelling at you right now because I'm thinking of you more highly than myself. That's, that's what's happening. You're seeing the fruit of that deeply held belief, right? That's not what, that doesn't come out. If you had that deeply held belief that God is faithful and just, we don't whip off with things from that place. It's a time of unbelief. Now, one of the problems, probably because of the fall, uh, is that we don't produce works like we would want to because we don't make the rules. Like, I think we would all like to produce work on the whole thing, feel like it's a wonderful expression of our ingenuity and our creativity and something, and then unveil it all at the beginning, you know, unveil it all to a big moment, round of applause. Uh, And that's not the way the world works. It's not the way God works. What he actually works in us is that we have to live in a state of trust. We have to live in a state where we believe him. We walk by faith. We obey God because of what we believe. And doing that leads us to plant seeds that we can't understand what God's going to do with those. We just, walking with him, this is like what mom was talking about in her talk, that small faithfulness, pursuing God, doing what is right in front of you to do. You're not necessarily dying to yourself and saying, in 30 years, this is going to be You don't know. You have no idea what that's going to be in 30 years, but God does know. So we follow him through little sacrifices, little faithfulness. But the fruit of all of these things is the fruit of the Spirit. The enormous harvest of glory and joy is not our doing. It's not according to our plans, and it does not reflect glory on us. Always a declaration of the gospel, a declaration of what led us to do that, which is belief in Christ. 
Now, it yields such disproportionate fruit because it is an expression of a true reality in the world, not an imaginary one. It makes no sense to the world why things would be like they are. Like, you will have noticed that through the entire history of Christianity, nobody has caught on that persecuting the church and martyrdom doesn't work. They're like, it can't possibly be. <laughs> this, it can't possibly be. Everyone's still like, no, what if we killed them? What if we just shushed them up? And every time it explodes in more and more believers. That's because it's God's world, his reality, his stories. It's not, and if we follow him, then disproportionate fruit and beauty and things come out of that. Our faith lives fully in, a real, in the real world, not just in our imaginations. It is true. It's real. And his name is Jesus Christ, and he really is reigning. He intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. He's real, and we know it. That's our big advantage, right? He's real, and we believe. And so everything that we understand, we understand through this. Everything we express, we express through this. But it's also true that our imaginations and our faith must be growing. We will always be finding little pockets of unbelief in ourselves. We will always, when I said our faith is much bigger than one little document, if it was just one little document, we could probably get it proofed enough times to make sure we weren't making big errors on it. But because it encompasses our whole life, what happens is it will keep finding places in ourselves that need to be confronted, little places where we don't want to lay it all down. We don't want to obey scripture. Uh, we don't want the real God of the Bible to intrude on a false God of our imagination. And this is the kind of thing that's happening whenever someone, someone who professes Christ, professes to believe God's word, but you, you know, maybe you show them a Bible verse, like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And they just sort of look at it They'll look at you and they'll be like, God would never ask that of me. <laughs> but oh, I think he did. I think he did right here. I think that. It's like, no, God wouldn't do that because we have some idolatrous thing going in our imagination thinking, no, I am, I am following God. I'm just following a God that, that the real God, I don't want him to intrude on this with his word. And so we must see that the Christian imagination, the soul, our faith, all of these things and however they overlap must be fed. We must be reading God's word. And more than that, we must be believing it as we do, letting it restructure our world, letting it restructure our understanding of the world, changing our instincts, confronting our sins and secrets. We must be students of it and hungry for it. The word of God is not dry doctrine, like information to be stuffed away somewhere in an appropriate file folder. It is living and it is active. Receiving the word of God is receiving something into your heart and imagination that will drive action. It is fueling a fire that powers your whole life. Everything that is coming out of you, the way you dress, the way you cook, the way you speak, the way you see and understand the world, the way you laugh and what you laugh at, the word of God shapes it all. Because if we believe it and receive it, it's shaping the very things that make you human, made in the image of God. It's making you more like Christ, shaping your soul, your imagination, and your faith. Hebrews 11 tells of giants of the faith, but these heroes are really just a prequel. It's a prequel edition of faith. They had faith, but Christ was still a promise in the distance. But listen to what that faith, that, ima that imagination accomplished through them. Now, when I, Paul says at the, well, I think it's Paul, the author of Hebrews says by the end of this that time doesn't allow him to say it all, and it doesn't allow me to say all that he says in it. So we'll just go skipping, skipping through some of this chapter. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. Then skipping, it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah did this. He built an ark. Now, think about this. If, if faith is like, I pulled my document of what I believe out, 
Why would that have motivated this level of things that he's citing? Noah building an ark and preparing for the destruction of the world except for his household. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he would receive as an inheritance. This was not a momentary application of something you believe. It's not like, oh, by faith. Like we talk like, back to that worldview thought, like you're driving a car and then you say, oh, I have to implement my faith right now, so I'll pull over and that's turning on my hazards, like faith. No, the whole thing is faith. The whole, the whole driving motion is what you believe about God and the world. And it says at the beginning of this that by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So this is talking about people who believed God created the world and they believed he had promised something in the future. And they are huge operations of faith because they're not talking about little, it's not a little moment of like, look, I believe this. It's talking about, by faith, Abraham offered up his son Isaac. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. By faith, Moses refused to be identified with Pharaoh's household and instead claimed God's people. Uh, By faith, he took all those people out of Egypt. By faith, he did this huge endeavor, got stuck in the wilderness with them all for a long time. Uh, By faith, he goes goes on and on with all of these people who did amazing things, uh, concluding with this wonderful, this wonderful part at the end that says, uh, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, women received their dead, raised to life, and one of the only things that can harmonize these things is those are, those are these wonderful, miraculous moments of faith that, that uh, were very victorious. And then it moves as though there's not really a difference. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better, res- re- better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains of, in, and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, since we also are part of this reality, this reality where God made all of these people victorious through their faith in him, through their understanding of what he was doing in the world, or simply who he was in the world, that he actually was God. What I love about this uh, is that, and this is just a random side, when we think of faith as being a car, like our documents that we get out to prove that we believe something, we're making faith very little. But one of the other things that we're doing is eliminating some of the most powerful child rearing things we could ever be doing, which is to recognize if you say faith, I have faith in these doctrines, it's very easy to say children can't understand that. But you can't claim that there is a child alive that doesn't have an imagination, that can't have an imagination that's available to be, to be captured. Like you know that moment when your kids are very little and you see them imagining something and playing something. They're better than we are at this. They are better than we are at accepting, and Christ calls this out, doesn't he? Unless you have faith like a child. They are better than we are at hearing, that's the way the world is, so I'm going to go do whatever. I have stopped one of my young sons from, who's going to jump. He had a cape on. He was, I mean, he was in a diaper, you know, but he put a Velcro cape on and thought he was going to fly down the stairs. Like, he was like, this will work out. I mean, I'm off. (laughs) And... That is faith like a child that somehow he, this had captured his imagination. He's like, I can do that. I got my cape on. Uh, or just children have, se- it's like um, in Magician's Nephew when Narnia, like literally anything that is thrown will grow, in, grow into a tree there. You know, like it's so fertile, it's so alive. But when you think in terms of shaping imagination and imagination actually being connected to faith, we're te- like, It's a totally different thing to say, bringing your children up in the faith, like bringing them up to believe these realities and these truths and telling them all the time things that are about that. Like I could think one of the, 
You know when your children go through a major phase of asking you questions all the time about everything? And it's very easy as a parent to get tired of that phase because you're like, can't really go into photosynthesis right now, you know? <laughs> can't remember the details, you know? One of our catch-all parenting things was always to say, that's because it's God's magic. Like, that's God's magic. He did that. Uh, this is what, this is a creation. This is God's world. This is God's magic. Or saying, I don't understand it. God did that. This is God's, this is what he has done. And when you think of how many Christians are gladly handing over the discipling of their children's imaginations to Disney, right? Go ahead, go watch that. Go watch whatever show it is. Like, gladly letting them grow up with their imaginations being discipled by people who hate God. It, it, I don't think we would do that if we were thinking in terms of imagination being such an expression of faith, such an expression of what are your most closely held beliefs. So the reality is this. A Christian imagination, in other words, an imagination that is full of Christ, full of him crucified and resurrected and reigning now, that is an imagination that will fuel and cannot help but fuel victorious living, right? Because it's in Christ. How could it not? Who are we following? Who are we looking towards? Whose confidence are we walking in? Who is sustaining us and equipping us? Who is providing for us, challenging us, comforting us, and protecting us? the one in whom we live and move and have our being. A little bit later in Hebrews, after that whole wonderful hall of faith, it says, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Does that not describe us well? <laughs> I can't, it's too tiring. Uh, but strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. Jesus Christ reigns and you can trust him. Now go live the full life of a woman who knows that to be so, believes that to be so, and lives like it is. It's a radically fruitful, shockingly countercultural, full of joy, victorious life that we have all been called to in him. Yeah.